This is the fifteenth lecture in the course two zero five signals and systems. And today's lecture is titled Anatomy of a Class Test and a continued look at the properties of Fourier transform. This course, as you know, is based the assessment shall be based on uh, class tests minor one, minor two, and major. This will be this will count twenty percent, this will count twenty percent, and this will count forty percent. Class tests there will be one, two, and three, and the worst of them will be thrown out minus the worst, worst score. So two of them will count, two out of three will count as twenty percent and that makes a total of forty percent. We had a recent test and <coughs> a review of the answers given by you show that some of the concepts are not quite clear and therefore I shall go into the depths of this question and solve them in the manner they should have been solved. The first question in the test says the unit impulse response of a system, that is HT, is equal to delta of alpha T. That is XT equal to delta T leads to HT equal to delta alpha T, where alpha is a real positive quantity. It is claimed that the system input output characteristics are given by yt equal to x of alpha t. Okay, it is claimed. Do you agree with the claim? <coughs> if yes, justify the claim. If not, find the correct relationship. Also, what happens when alpha is negative? That is the question. I have got a spectrum of answers. The correct answer should have been like this. HT is delta of alpha T. First, let's consider alpha as positive. Then we'll see what happens when alpha is negative. <coughs> so Y of T by convolution is X of T convolved with H of T and the convolution integral is minus infinity to infinity. Uh, we can either shift h or shift x. Let's keep h the same, delta alpha tau, then x t minus tau d tau. Many of the people have shifted delta and have argued that this is the same, delta alpha tau is the same as delta tau, which is obviously wrong. And to emphasize that point, I have not shifted h of t. I have put this as delta alpha tau. Now, I make a transformation, that is, I make alpha tau equal to some constant, let's say zeta. Then my integral becomes delta zeta x of t minus tau is zeta by alpha. Then d tau is d zeta over alpha and the limits of the integral when tau goes from minus infinity to plus infinity alpha is a positive constant so there is no change in the limits of the integral and that's what I get and this is where you have to apply the definition of a delta function that it exists only when its argument is equal to is equal to zero, zero. okay so if za, if zeta is zero then this this function simply becomes x of t and alpha comes out of the bracket. In other words, what we have is y t becomes equal to 1 over alpha minus infinity to plus infinity, then delta zeta x of t minus zeta by alpha d zeta, d zeta, alpha I have taken out. Now we argue that this function exists only when zeta equals to zero. In other words, this is one by alpha x of t. This is the correct answer. 
Sir, but sir, we have used the condition that the system is LTI. But it's not given in the question paper that the system is LTI. Where have you used the condition that it is LTI? Sir, we shifted the X. That is correct. So, you have to assume that the system is LTI. Yes. If it was not LTI, then it is not possible to solve for the system. Quite so. Because then it's a impulse response is a general function of T and tau. It is not T minus tau. That is delta T minus tau does not lead to H of T minus tau. Correct? This point is appreciated. That implicit is the assumption that the system is linear and time invariant. Okay. If alpha is negative, then you see everything remains the same except that the limits of the integral, you get the same thing, delta mm -hmm. zeta x of t minus zeta by alpha d zeta, except that the limits will now change from plus infinity to minus infinity, all right, which you can take care by saying minus infinity to plus infinity and you say minus sign here. But since alpha itself is negative, 1 by minus alpha is a positive quantity and therefore this simply becomes 1 by mod alpha, that is ignoring the sign, times x of t. And this result obviously is true for alpha greater than 0 or alpha less than 0. A question, can alpha be equal to 0? No. No. All right. That solves this question. Let's go to question number 2. It is said that if you spend a little time on reading the question thoroughly and understanding it, then half of the question has been solved. If you understand the question, half of the question has been solved. And this has been reflected in your answers to question number two. Many of you hurriedly went into detailed equations and so on and so forth. You failed to appreciate the language. Let me read the language. It says there is a feedback system. This is question number two. <coughs> feedback system x of t and then there is a feedback. This goes directly to y of t. y of t is then delayed by a quantity capital T and then multiplied by a quantity alpha. This is the system. Feedback because uh, this is fit forward, x of t is the given signal, part of the output is fed back to form the effective input, all right. This input is x of t plus alpha y, this is y of t, and therefore this is y of t minus capital T, and this quantity is alpha y of t minus capital T, so this is alpha y of t minus cap t, and in other words, the equation to the system is yt equal to xt plus alpha y of t minus capital T. All right. This is the system that is given. And if you had read the question carefully, question part 1 says, find the impulse response ht of this system by inspection. The word inspection is important. You do not have to solve this equation. If you look at the system, then one can easily derive what the impulse response is. Let me write the system again. I want to find the impulse response, so my x of t is delta t. Delta t comes here. This is my h of t then. And delta t is delayed by capital T multiplied by alpha and fed here. So, at, obviously, there is another condition given, that is assuming initial risk, which is important. That means ht is equal to 0 for t less than 0. For t less than 0, the input is not applied, initial risk, and therefore ht is equal to 0. Now, when delta t is applied, at t, delta t has its existence only at t equal to 0. You see there is nothing to stop delta t from going to the output. As far as this part is concerned, this part is not actuated before a time interval of capital T has passed because there is a delay here. 
and therefore instantaneously ht at t equal to 0 should be simply equal to delta t at t equal to 0. Then what happens? At capital T time later, at capital T time later, so delta t has stopped, but delta t after coming here, it has become delta t minus cap t, then it's multiplied by alpha. When it reaches the summing junction, delta t has disappeared, and therefore the only thing that you get here is alpha delta t minus capital T. This is the story at t equal to small t equal to cap t. All right. At this instant of time, this first term has no effect. Similarly, if you keep on looking at this and simply watch the output, twice capital T instead later, another impulse shall come which shall circulate this twice and therefore the gain shall be alpha squared. It is the same it is this alpha delta t minus cap t which now goes like this so it becomes alpha delta of t minus 2 cap t then multiplied by alpha so it is alpha squared delta t minus 2 t plus etc and this continues ad infinitum there is nothing to stop it and therefore this is the to infinity this is the impulse response of the system all right and this is obtained by inspection. No solution of a difference, differential equation is needed. And the second part of the question was, if this is h of t, find the range of gain alpha such that this feedback system becomes unstable. Now h of t is equal to delta t plus alpha delta t minus cap t plus alpha squared delta t minus 2t and so on. You are required to find out the conditions of the system on alpha such that the system becomes unstable. Now obviously I can write this as, now I will apply the DIBO condition that is bounded input, bounded output, stability condition. And this can be written as alpha to the i delta t minus i t where i goes from 0 to infinity. Alright. So what I do is now <coughs> I find out minus infinity to infinity mod h tau d tau. This uh, mod h tau d tau, uh, you must understand this carefully. This, what is the relationship between this and this? What is, which one is greater? <coughs> the left hand side. Left hand side is either greater than or equal. All right. Now, this is the crucial point. You have to recognize that what I have to show is that h tau is absolutely integrable if the system is to be stable. Now, not h tau. Now, this is a summation of terms and I cannot use the, this is not equal to the integral with every term absolutely integrated. And therefore, I use the inequality that this must be greater than or equal to h tau data. Now, obviously, if I integrate, if I integrate this from minus infinity to infinity, then the only thing that remains is alpha to the i, i equal to 0 to infinity. Because integral delta t minus i t from minus infinity to plus infinity is equal to 1 i t must fall within the range minus infinity to plus infinity. And obviously, this will tend to infinity if alpha greater than, greater than equal to 1. Does it, does it have to be positive? Mod alpha greater than 1. Mod alpha. alpha. If mod alpha greater is greater than 1. Alright? Equal, 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 equal to 1. What about equal? Then also it will yeah. diverge. Yeah. Then also it will diverge. So alpha cannot be allowed to be unity either, all right? Because it will be sum of 1, 1, 1, 1 and so on. Can alpha 
be equal to minus one. No. Then it is indeterminate. We do not know where the where infinity is. Well, alternate terms cancel, but I don't know where infinity is, and therefore this may not be permitted. All right. So the condition for instability is mod alpha greater than one. The third question, question three, was state with reason whether the system described by the difference equation y n equal to x n plus three u n plus one is linear or nonlinear, stable or unstable, memoryless or not. Time invariant or time varying, causal or non causal, and invertible or non invertible. That is the question. Firstly, with respect to linearity, I told you that you need not necessarily go through alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 and so on. You need not necessarily, because if you can find one counter example, that's good enough to show this system is non linear. All right? And the counter example is obvious. For a linear system, zero input should lead to zero output. So, xn equal to zero does not lead to yn equal to zero, and therefore the system is non linear. Very simple. All right. Then the question of stability. Stability. Well, mod y of n is less than or equal to, if I take the mods individually, x of n could be positive or negative, and therefore this would be less than or equal to x n plus 3 mod u n plus 1. Now, if x of n is bounded, x of n less than l, less than equal to l, less than infinity, if x of n is bounded, then obviously y of n is less than equal to l plus 3. At the most, this can be equal to 3. If n is minus, less than minus 1, then it's 0. But it must be less than l plus 3, which is less than infinity. And therefore, the system is stable. You have to give a solid argument. You will see that in your uh, answer scripts, there are question marks. The argument is not proper or right. Then the question is y n equal to x n plus 3 u n plus 1. Is the system memoryless or not? <coughs> it is memoryless. Why? Right? Because y of n depends on x of n only. That there is a constant term here which exists for n greater than or equal to minus 1 is immaterial. Dependence is on input and output. It does not, y of n does not depend on any of the past values, either input or output, and therefore the system does not have memory. It does not remember anything. So it is memoryless. Time invariant or time varying? It is time varying. Because, well, you have to give the logic now. x1 of n leads to y1 of n, which is equal to x1 of n plus 3 u n plus 1. Now, if you delay x1 by n arbitrary integer, let's say n naught, x2 of n equal to x1 n minus n naught, this leads to y2 of n, which is equal to x1 of n minus n naught plus 3 u n plus 1. This does not change. And this is not equal to y1 of n minus n naught, and therefore the system is time varying. All right? If, if there is a question, please do stop me. Is it causal? It is causal. Because y of n, for the same token, y of n depends on the present input only. It does not require the future input, therefore, yes, it is causal. Not anticipative. Is it invertible or not? Yes, yes, yes. Invertible, that is very simple to see. It is invertible because x of n can be recovered from y of n. All that you need is from y of n, you subtract 3u n plus n. 
and therefore this is correct inverted. Okay, then question number four. Question number four. The question was to determine the unit step response and not impulse response. Because we did in the tutorial class impulse response example, also in the in the lecture here, some people, I would say a sizable fraction of the people found out H of N. There is no reason why you should find H of N. The difference equation is y of n plus one quarter y of n minus one minus three by eight y of n minus two equal to x of n minus x of n minus one. This is the equation to be solved. Given that the system is at initial rest, that is y of n is zero, n less than zero. And x of n is u of n, not delta n. Obviously, you see the equation to be solved, if I put x of n equal to u of n, well, so, some people have, have found out h of n, and then they have convolved h of n with u of n. Well, this is perfectly legitimate, perfectly all right, except that, except that they could not convolve, they could not evolve the convolution. That was the problem. That was the problem there. Because H of N contains three terms and we didn't know what to do with the third term. All right. We, this is the simplest thing to do is to recognize that the right hand side is indeed a delta function. X of N minus X of N minus 1 is delta N because this is U of N minus U of N minus 1. All right. So our equation therefore is Y of N plus 1 quarter Y of N minus 1 minus 3 eighth y of n minus 2 equal to delta n. That's it. And obviously y of n by the usual procedure it is the solution to the homogeneous equation y h n plus the particular integral y p n and in this particular integral many people faltered. They took the right hand side to be 1 um, and uh, there was a problem. y p n obviously for n greater than 0 the right hand side becomes equal to 0 the steady state solution therefore would be a constant which is equal to 0. If you put y p n equal to y, right hand side equal to 0, obviously capital Y is equal to 0. In the examples that we took in the class, capital Y was non-zero and therefore many people were wondering as to what would happen so they put some number and some people even assume that y of n equal, let y of n be equal to some constant k. Where does this constant come from? Anyway, the, <coughs> therefore the particular solution is, uh, is 0 and our equation becomes y of n minus 2 equal to 0. This is the homogeneous equation and the solution to this shall give you the total solution because the particular solution is 0. And this is obviously of the form A. Now, if you want to solve this, you try a solution y of n equal to alpha to the n and therefore you get, if you substitute this, you get alpha squared plus one quarter alpha minus three eight equal to zero and there are two values of alpha, alpha equal to half and minus three quarter. That two, I do not know how it came, but two figured in many answers that one of the possible values of alpha is equal to 2. Uh, there are also mistakes about uh, the signs. Well, it's a quadratic equation and I expect that you'll be able to solve the quadratic equation correctly, the two values. And therefore, the solution is a half to the n plus b minus 3 quarter to the power m. At this point, some students wondered how to take, how to evaluate A and B. Obviously, we require two initial conditions. Whereas, many of you obtained Y of 0, Y of N, and Y of 2. And somehow or other, you ruled, many of you ruled this out. You solved for uh, A and B from Y, from 1 and 2. Well, don't you realize that to find out Y of 1, you have to utilize Y of 0. And that Y of 0, y of 1 is not independent of y of 0 and therefore these three are not independent initial conditions. 
only two of them can be independent. Because y, calculation of y of 2, that's the equal y of 0 and y of 1. And therefore this is a function of y of 0 and y of 1. It's not independent. Anyway, the uh, two initial conditions would be y of n. Let me write the equation again. Plus 1 quarter y of n minus 1 minus 3 eighth y of n minus 2. Our equation was this is equal to delta n. And therefore y of 0 is equal to y of 0, y of minus 1 is 0, y of minus 2 is 0, and that is simply equal to 1. Delta n is equal to 1. And y of 1 shall be equal to minus 1 quarter y of 0. Delta n has gone into the background, and therefore this is simply minus 1 quarter. And this is good enough to solve for a and b. Our general solution was a half to the power n plus b minus 3 quarter to the power n is equal to what? H is 1. This was YFN, not HN. No. This is the step response, unit step response. You can call it psi n. All right. It depends on? N. What depends on N? The value. The value depends on N. So I put the initial conditions. Y of 0 is A plus B and this is equal to 1 and Y of 1 is equal to uh, A by 2 minus 3b by 4 equal to minus 1 quarter. It is at this point at least 5 students made a mistake. To solve these two simultaneous equations, if you make a mistake, this shall be punished seriously in the future. It was taken very light note of only 50 percent was deducted. So A a, I think, is two fifth. Let me see what my solution. Yes, A is two fifth and B is three fifth. One got all kinds of numbers: seven by five, four by five, and so on. It's a wide spectrum. This is the correct solution. And then finally, finally. Note this very carefully. Our solution is 2 fifth half to the power n plus 3 fifth minus 3 quarter to the power n. If you have left it at this, then your solution is wrong. Because we have assumed all n, unless you specify that this is to be multiplied by u of n, well, you are to be penalized seriously in future. For the present, only one point out of nine. And therefore, I have given aid to those who have not written U of N. U of N must be written. The final question, question five, was a quick one, quickly cooked one. It was X of T equal to sine pi T squared. And the question was, does it have a Fourier series representation? You have to give reasons for your answer. Well, Fourier series representation, the first and foremost condition is it must be periodic. All right. Then the question is, is it periodic? If you satisfy that it is periodic, then you have to go to the Dirichlet conditions. That is, either of the two sets of conditions. One is energy, is it an energy signal? Or alternatively, is it an absolutely integrable finite number of finite maxima and so on and so forth. That is the Dirichlet condition. First question is, is it periodic? Now, many of you have cor written correctly, no, it is not, it does not have a Fourier series representation. But you went round the corner to search for a logic. Why not? Well, you see, the very, very simple logic is this. It should have occurred to you immediately. Some people wrote that this can be written as e to the j pi t squared plus e to the minus, uh, e to the minus j pi t squared divided by 2. And this is not of the form e to the j k pi t or e to the j omega naught t and so on and so forth. All right. That strictly is not correct. That strictly is not the logic. Simple logic should have been, and it's a very simple problem. A simple problem should have a simple solution. Is it periodic or not? Just look at the zero crossings or just look at the maxima. Where are the zero crossings? x t equal to zero. Where? When t equals to zero, then 
plus minus 1, you see, pi t squared is 0 pi, the next 0 occurs is 2 pi, so plus minus root 2, then plus minus root 3, then plus minus 2, then plus minus root 5, plus minus root 6, plus minus root 7, plus minus root 8 and so on. Now are these at regular intervals? Not at all. Well, they may not be regular intervals, but do they have a regularity in the pattern? For example, I could have, let's say, I could have like this, this interval, if this interval is the same for the next period, it would have been all right. There is neither, these are neither regular space nor is there a regularity of pattern. And that is the system, the signal itself is not periodic and the question of Fourier series representation doesn't arise. Some people also invoke the display conditions. The display conditions have to be invoked only if the signal is periodic. Some of you try to find out, and this is a correct answer, although the thinking is a bit distant, but it is the correct answer. Some of you try to find out A T0 such that sine of pi t squared is equal to sine of pi t plus t0 squared. He expanded this and then found out that t0 becomes a function of t. small t. This is a correct answer. Although, as I said, the thinking is a bit twisted. It should have occurred to you zero crossing or even maxima. Sine is a maximum when the argument is plus minus pi by to maximum or minimum, all right? And, and therefore, if you had simply uh, gone pi by 2, 3 pi by 2 and so on and so forth, this would also have given you the answer. Okay, now a continued look at, uh, unless you have a question, a continued look at the uh, character of this transformation, the Fourier transform properties. Right, uh, the last or the last occasion, that is the 14th lecture, we had left at this point. That is, if x of t is the pair of capital X of omega, then x of alpha t, where alpha is a real constant, positive or a negative, the pair is 1 over mod alpha, <coughs> positive or negative, it does not matter, capital X of omega by alpha. Now this, along with two other examples that we have done, you see what we are doing is, we are, is this stretching or uh, compression? X of alpha, it depends, it depends on the value of alpha. So it is either dilation or compression. Dilation or compression produces a reverse effect in the frequency domain. That is, it produces omega by alpha. That is, if this is a dilation, then this is a compression. Is that clear? If alpha t, if x of alpha t is an expansion, a stretch, well, when does it occur? When alpha is less than 1. That is, when alpha is less than 1, it is a stretching, and you see in the frequency domain it is a compression. And this is a fact of life, it is a fact of nature, that between the two domains, T and omega, both are physical domains. A frequency can be experimented in the laboratory, it can be measured, both are physical quantities, and if you stretch in one of the domains, in the other domain, it is a compression. And this is always true. It, it can go from here to here also. It's a it's a one to one <coughs> transformation. Fourier transform is a one to one or a unique transformation. It's a distinct transformation. The Fourier system, Fourier transform is looked at as a linear system, an operator. Then this operator produces distinct outputs for distinct inputs. What does it mean? In terms of linear system it means the system is invertible. invertible. And this is what is implied by this. That is, you can go either from t to omega or from omega to t, you shall get the same result. And this brings us to the philosophical question of duality. Alright? That is, there is a duality 
amongst the two domains. Let me recollect another fact of duality. That if you have in the time domain a pulse like this, minus t to plus t, and let's say this is 1, if this is your x of t, then your capital X of omega is a sine x by x form that is <coughs> it is like this. And the precise value is 2 sine omega t1. Please do remember this. You don't, you should not be required to look at your notes again and again. You must remember this like your first name, alright? If x of t is a pulse like this, t1 and t1, capital T is also a period, then the spectrum is twice sine omega t1 by omega. We can write this in the form of a sync function. That's a separate story. We also remember that um, if in the, time, in the frequency domain it is, a, it is a window like this, that is minus w to plus w, if capital X of omega is like this, then its inverse transform, which we had found out last time or last before one, its inverse transform is of the same form, that is, it is of the form of sine x by x again. And precisely its value is sine of, sine of wt divided by pi t. You must remember these two. That is going from a, rect a rectangular pulse to its spectrum or a rectangular spectrum to the time domain. Both are sin x by x form. And you must remember these constants. 2 sin of 81 by omega and sin of wt by pi t. And you see duality being displayed here also, except for multiplying constants. The nature of the pattern is the same. If this is a pulse, a rectangular pulse, then this is an oscillating, a damped oscillating waveform. If this is a pulse in the frequency domain, then this is a damped oscillating waveform in the time domain. Now, I had promised at that time that we will take the question of duality a little more analytically at a later point of time, and it is the time now to consider the question of duality. Let me state duality <coughs> in precise terms. It says that if, in general, if f of t is the pair of capital F of omega, this is the theorem of duality. And we shall prove it. If f of t is the pair of capital F of omega, that is, if the Fourier transform of small f is capital F, then, then capital F of t, that is, if this functional form, you see, in the, in the case of the rectangular pulse, this functional form was the sine x by x. So, if in the time domain this functional form comes, f of t, then this is the pair of 2 pi f of minus omega. That is, the time domain functional form goes over now to the frequency domain except for a change of sign of the argument f of minus omega. And to prove this, let's consider uh, <coughs> the definition of f of omega. The proof is instructive, but slightly, uh, slightly uh, innovative in the sense that uh, we use simple facts, but we use a, a change of variable. Let us recall that f of omega is equal to integral minus infinity to infinity small f of t e to the power j omega t dt. Is that right? Minus, minus j omega. All right. Now we, we argue that in this right hand integral, in this right hand integral small t is a dummy variable. And therefore, I can change this small t into, let's say, some other variable zeta. The value shall not change. All right? If we do that, then we write this as minus infinity to infinity f of zeta e to the power minus j omega zeta d zeta. All right? This is f of omega, the functional form. Now I replace omega by t. 
I can do that on both sides. I replace omega by t. You see, I have to bring in f of t. So, what I did was, I could not put omega into t here, because t already occurs in the integral. That's why I have to throw away t in favor of another dummy variable, some dummy variable, zeta. All right? Then I put omega equal to t. Therefore, I get minus infinity to infinity f of zeta e to the power minus j t zeta d zeta. All right? Let me write it again. f of t is equal to minus infinity to infinity f of zeta e to the power minus j t zeta d zeta. Now, as far as this integral is concerned, zeta is a dummy variable. The total integral is a, it's a definite integral, it's a function of time, t. So, zeta is a dummy variable and there is no reason why I cannot replace zeta by some other arbitrary dummy variable. Let us put zeta equal to minus omega. Alright? Then this d zeta would be minus d omega and this is replaced by minus omega and what happens to the integral, the uh, limits of the integral? They change from plus infinity to minus infinity. But if you take care of this negative sign, then the limits can be restored. In other words, this is the same as minus infinity to infinity f of minus omega e to the power j omega t d omega. Is that correct? And what is this? Isn't this simply equal to the Fourier? Two pi, I'm sorry, two pi times. All right. What we do is, I write this as two pi times one over two pi. Then, don't you see that this is two pi times the Fourier inverse of f of minus omega. So, I finally prove that f of t, capital F of t, is the pair of 2 pi f of minus omega. And this is the theorem of duality. If f of t is the pair of capital F of omega, then this must be true. This is the theorem of duality. In order to make an imprint of this, let me write this theorem again f of t pair of capital F of omega implies by duality that capital F of t is the pair of 2 pi small f of minus omega. There are very interesting applications of this of this theorem and, and there are many examples in practice which we can solve by applying this principle of duality. For example, <coughs> you know that um, e to the minus mod t, alright, is a pair of 2 divided by omega square plus 1. We did this uh, sometime earlier. e to the minus t ut was a pair of 1 by j omega plus 1 and e to the t u of minus t which is on the left hand side was simply 1 by 1 minus j omega and therefore the sum of the two gives you 2 by omega square plus 1. Now if the question is that in the time domain the function is 2 by t square plus 1 then what is the Fourier transform of this? Obviously, by applying this theorem, what we have done is omega will be replaced by t, and therefore it should be 2 pi f of minus omega, which simply means e to the power minus mod omega. All right? We didn't have to integrate this 2 by t square plus 1 e to the minus t omega. The integration is not, in fact, a simple integration. I mean, if you have to do it directly by defining but from the definition, it would have been a tough job. We didn't have to do that. Other consequences of um, 
you recall that uh, if x of t is the pair of capital X of omega, then dx dt is the pair of j omega, j omega x of omega. Now suppose we, we differentiate this, we differentiate the spectrum, that is we, we apply the duality principle, then by applying the duality principle we can easily show that this is, can you guess what this will be? x of t shall now be multiplied by jt, but with a negative sign because of that f of minus omega because of that negative. It can also be shown very simply from the definition. x of omega is minus infinity to infinity x of t, I beg your pardon, I should take the inverse relationship, not this one. x of t no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Let's take this. Capital X of omega is minus infinity to infinity X of t e to the plus or minus minus, minus j omega t dt. Now I, I differentiate with respect to omega, and I can differentiate within the integral sign because this is a the variable here is small t, and therefore if I differentiate then I get minus j t X t e to the minus j omega t dt and therefore dx d omega is the pair of minus j t x t. It is also directly provable but it also follows from the uh, duality theorem. We can, uh, we have also seen that if x of t is the pair of capital X of omega then x of t minus t0 is the pair of e to the minus j omega t0, t0 times x of omega. All right. Now, if I do this in the time domain, that is, capital X of omega minus omega 0, what is the pair of this? Obviously, it should be a multiplication by an exponential. All right. It, you can show that this is e to the j omega 0 t x of t, as simple as that. Well, this can also be proved directly. Can you do that? Yes. <coughs> if you find the Fourier transform of this, instead of well, minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the j omega 0 t, then you multiply by e to the minus j omega t dt, and therefore these two terms can be combined into the minus j omega minus omega 0 t, which is simply capital X of omega minus omega z. So this can also be proved directly. And finally, <coughs> you recall that if you integrate x of t from minus infinity to t, then the Fourier transform of this is capital X of omega by j, by j omega plus x0 pi, was there a pi? Yes. Capital X of 0 then delta, delta, delta omega. If I do this in the frequency domain now, minus infinity to omega let's say, X of some arbitrary variable eta, d eta, what shall we get here? We shall get precisely the same form except that instead of T I shall get minus T. Alright, so what I shall get is x of t by jt minus plus pi x of 0, then this is small x, then multiplied by delta t. It can also be proved directly. But you see these relations are not relations which can be remembered easily. Alright? So one has to have a little practice in this and I strongly suggest that you prove this directly also in the same manner, taking the even part and the odd part and so on and so forth. And this is a good point to stop for the 16th lecture.